Okay, just introduce myself a little bit. My name is Patty Manley. I am the Program Review and Outcomes Assessment Facilitator at San Diego Miramar College. It's in the San Diego Community College District. Um, it is a combined position with Program Review and Outcomes Assessment. Um, it's pretty much a full-time uh, gig, if you will. I do also teach history. I'm a history uh, professor here at Miramar. Uh, but for the last couple of years, I've been working very closely with program review and outcomes assessment uh, with our faculty and uh, guiding them in that way. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I did ask that you, <laughs> excuse me, add in the chat who you are, and we've done that a little bit because I think it's kind of important to understand, are you a, an outcomes coordinator? Do you have experience as a program review coordinator? Are you the department chair who uh, tries to facilitate all these things or if you're a program lead? And it looks like we have a pretty good mix of folks here um, from all different parts of uh, the United States, which is great, from Florida to Massachusetts, Oregon, California. We have some really good folks here. So I'm happy that you were able to join us. Um, just to get started, I try to make these presentations pretty casual. Um, so if you want to ask a question, there's not that many of us here, you know, just raise your hand or unmute and you can feel free to interrupt me and we can just have a casual conversation. Uh, program review itself is, uh, can be pretty uh, boring, <laughs> it can be pretty cumbersome, it can be pretty frustrating. And so I think it's good just to have folks that you can just ask questions with and who you can talk to and kind of uh, work things through and see how other schools are doing it. Um, so I always start with what's really the purpose of program review. Um, for most of us, the intent of program review is to improve your program, continuous quality improvement. That's the reason why we do program review to begin with. Uh, we also should be doing program review to evaluate the effectiveness of our program. Are we following and meeting our program's mission? Are we meeting our college mission? Um, are we meeting students where they are? Are we providing them what they need? Um, and also program review is to identify your needs, um, not just uh, equipment or technology, but it might be uh, facilities, it might be faculty, it might be some kind of support system. So you use program review to also identify your program needs. And then as you're doing program review, you also want to think about and consider the direction of your program. Is it going where you want it to go? Uh, does it look like what it you want it to look like as a campus? And are you having conversations, really good conversations um, with other faculty within your program, with your uh, support staff, with your administration? Um, are you having those good conversations about why are we doing program review to begin with? And this is often a conversation that campuses struggle with. Um, and certainly faculty sometimes struggle with this, instructional faculty, because we, you know, tend to think that we do all this work, we look at, you know, write all these great reports, you know, we look at our strengths and weaknesses, we look at our data, and then what comes out of that. And sometimes that's why it can be a little frustrating. Uh, but if we go into it with good intentions and we understand why are we doing it in the first place, it can be very effective and it can be very helpful uh, for uh, identifying all the things that we just talked about, improving your program, if looking at the effectiveness of your program, identifying your needs or resources and looking at your program direction. <clears throat> so when we're doing program review, um, we have to think who's responsible for program review. And this is important because oftentimes the process of program review falls on one person. Uh, it falls on either uh, an instructional faculty, somebody who happens to be working in that discipline who maybe um, feels more comfortable doing things with technology or has some experience with program review from a different uh, campus or something. But program review should really be a very collaborative process. It should involve everyone from administrators to your support professionals, your instructional faculty, and even students. You should be looking at it holistically because if you're just looking at you and your program, then, and you're not, you know, you need to move out of those silos 
and start talking to other folks um, and bringing their thoughts and ideas into your program as well. Because you really wanna be collaborating um, with other areas on your campus when you're doing program review. You might wanna be talking to administrators about budgets or about resources. Uh, you would be talking to support professionals if you have a tutoring center or your student services areas, your libraries, you might want to be talking to those folks as you're doing program review and incorporating some of their, their ideas and services into your program review. And certainly as instructional faculty, if you're in instruction, um, you should include all faculty when you're completing your program review. Um, not just uh, contract faculty or full-time faculty, but you should be including all the adjunct faculty in that conversation as well. And of course, why not include your students? You can survey your students and ask them, does our program, is our program meeting your needs? Is it providing you with what uh, you need to get your degree or certificate, transfer, whatever it is their uh, educational goals might be? Um, and you would also be thinking about when you're talking to students, um, is, the, is the campus per, meeting them where they are? Are we, are we meeting them, not just what they need in that program, but what other things are they needing uh, that would make them be successful in the program? Um, so with lots of things to look at uh, when you're looking at program review. Um, how many of you, it's just you doing program review? Let's see, we have, I, I'm gonna read some of the, the chat. Uh, I'm not really good at keeping track of chat while I'm talking. So I'm just gonna go back and read a little bit. So we have Thomas Berry here from San Bernardino College. Uh, great area, just kind of north uh, east a little bit of San Diego. Uh, Angela, she's a, you're a lead and instructor at Riverside City College and you're going to be doing your first program review. Good luck. Um, it can be very tasking, a very you know intensive uh, task that you need to do, but it's also really enjoyable and rewarding if you will. And then we have Danny, who is a slow coordinator. Um, you're also very experienced with program review, accreditation, curriculum from Coastline College. That's awesome. Looks like you've had a lot of experience uh, in many areas in regards to program review and outcomes assessment. Excuse me, I'm gonna go back up here. Whoops, we went a little too far here, hold on. All right, so, you know, we, we talked about what's the intent of program review, what should you do? But if you really think about program review, what is it? Program review really should be measuring how well your program is advancing your college mission and goals. It should be uh, looking at it from the lens of how do we improve programs. But really the whole intent of program review is to improve student learning. Everything you do on campus should be looked through the lens of we want to improve student learning. So I, I always try to think about if you're looking at, sorry about that, if you're looking at uh, your college mission, you're going to look at your strategic goals and plans. If you have ISLOs, your division goals, your program goals and your outcomes, either way you look at it, they're all interconnected. But the one thing that you really wanna think about as you're going through your program review, the real intent is how are we going to improve student learning? That's really the purpose of program review. Um, you can do all these great things and maybe make an instructor's life great or make a student services life great or add some new equipment. But if none of that advances student learning or improves student learning or meets students where they are, uh, then it's really not meeting the true intent of program review. I like to put this diagram up because oftentimes for many of us, and I saw some of your titles, you might be a program review coordinator, or maybe that's assigned to somebody and you're planning an institutional effectiveness department. Um, and then you also might have a slow coordinator uh, who does the you know, outcomes assessment for your program or for your courses. And sometimes they're to two totally different functions um, or positions on your campus. Um, and to me and, and to our college and, and in some ways to our district, we try to look at them as you can't do one without the other. In order to write a really good program review, you need to really look at your outcomes as well. And when you're writing your course outcomes, you need to be thinking about your program. So there are two, they run simultaneously. There are two concurrent um, systems that are processes that go together. 
And in a typical assessment cycle, you're doing both. Um, you're doing your unit or course assessments, your program learning outcome assessments um, throughout your cycle, whatever your cycle is, three years, five years, six years. And some point during that cycle, you're probably doing your program review as well. How many of you um, have two different positions um, on your campus? People who are, you can just like, you know, put a thumbs up or something. Do you have somebody who does uh, program review and then somebody else who does, you know, outcomes assessment? Um, do you ever sit down and talk to each other? I'm reading Jess's comments and she says she does both program review herself and she helps uh, faculty leads in their own program review. Do you have anyone who does course assessments? So Julie says, all this happens in my department, but by different people. Um, some campuses have a outcomes coordinator who just works with outcomes um, and instructs, helps faculty and student services folks with outcomes and outcomes assessment. Um, and oftentimes, as I said before, program review is uh, oftentimes it's signed at an administrative task, if you will. Um, and so it will be this person in planning institutional effectiveness who kind of helps, you know, works with uh, faculty or other uh, department coordinators or supervisors or chairs and helping them write their program review. But if you can marry those two together, it really functions really well. And we're finding on our campus that by having these two processes um, under one area, if you will, that uh, we've been able to improve both of them and we can really see the connections. Um, all right, so the next thing I want to kind of show you a little bit, and I feel like I'm talking really fast that we might finish a little bit early. So if you have any questions, please just raise your hand or pop in. I can't see everybody at one time. So just uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and speak up if you have a question. Um, I always like to kind of show this, whoops, back a little bit, this uh, diagram, if you will, to show you how it's all interconnected. We have as our program, our program mission statement. Under our programs, we have our program learning outcomes for all our degrees, certificates, our awards. We have our program mission and we have all of our courses that help support our program or required for our program. We'll, we will always be doing course assessment and we're gonna be developing outcomes based on the intent of those courses and how those courses help a student uh, go through the program. We'll also be doing course assessment or outcomes assessment. Uh, and oftentimes we look at, when we look at course assessment, we, okay, we have to close the loop, but where does that loop really close at? Does it close once you have, oh goodness, so <laughs> we're moving way up. Once we have uh, our findings, no, we have to, we have our outcomes assessment, we complete our assessment, we look at our findings, we pull all that data together, we sit down and we should have conversations once we have our findings. So to be going to have a conversation with the other faculty within your department about those courses. You should have uh, conversations with your dean, with the students, um, with the VPI or one of your VPSS, whoever your student services VP is. Um, and you, ha after having all those conversations, you want to create some action plans. What are you going to do now that you have your course assessment findings? Um, oftentimes we look at those action plans and say, okay, we have, this is what we want to do. Now, what do we need to do that? So we're going to, you know, we oftentimes look at program review as, oh, well, let's do program review because that's what gets us something. Uh, we get resources if we do program review. Um, and unfortunately, that's oftentimes uh, the lens through what program review is looked at is, well, we do program review because then we get something. Um, and oftentimes we don't get anything because there's no money. And so we say, well, what's the purpose of doing program review? Uh, so it's a cycle. Look at your program mission, look at your course assessment, look at your courses, develop some really quality course outcomes and program learning outcomes, do your assessment, create some really good action plans. If you need resources to complete those action plans, then of course you're gonna ask for them. Um, identify what other kinds of needs you, you might have. You might have, uh, you might need tutoring services, other faculty, not just material things. 
And you're going to put those needs in your program review, but you're going to tie all those needs to some type of program goal. Um, and so you're going to always be working on this cycle. Um, every Whatever your cycle is, you're going to be completing all of these things as you go through your program review cycle. <coughs> Excuse me. During your college assessment cycle, whatever that might be, uh, you're also going to be you're going to be analyzing your program learning outcomes. You're going to be looking at that data. Are students learning uh, the program information or the skills? Um, oftentimes, you know, we we struggle with how we're going to evaluate program outcomes, but they're really important. And there's various ways you can do that. And there was probably a session on that today or tomorrow about assessing program learning outcomes. In your cycle, you're also going to be looking at student learning outcomes and data related to those. Are the students learning the course skills and information um, that you expect them to take away from that course in order to be successful and achieve that degree or award for your program? Um, and as you're analyzing both of these, do you see any trends that might emerge? Um, and if so, you need to start making note of them. What are they? Because once you understand what those trends are, then you can start addressing them in your program review. So how many of you are also responsible for assessing program learning outcomes? You can add that to the chat and we can look at that in a little bit. So how do you use this data? So, you know, we always say, I just told you, you're doing unit assessment, course assessment, program learning assessment. You're doing all of that in preparation for your program review. Uh, you have all this information, you have all this data. Now, how do you use it? So you're going to be looking at uh, the findings from those. And if you have the ability to disaggregate the findings, um, that's a really good way to look at it or a lens to look through it. And you can disaggregate findings in many ways. You can disaggregate them by student population. Um, you can look at uh, whoever your DEI population might be on your campus. You can disaggregate data by if it's, you know, mode, uh, modality, when is it offered, time that it's offered, is it online, is it on face-to-face, -face? is it on, however, there's many ways to disaggregate data. And if you use Canvas and you use uh, your course assessments, you can incorporate assessments into Canvas, then you can extrapolate some of that data that may be on your, uh, you know, if you use like a, a, a PRED program or, you know, Tableau or something like that, you could have that additional data about student enrollment, um, student success, retention. But if you can complete your assessments in Canvas, then it's easier to disaggregate data by subpopulations a little bit more. Um, you can also use looking at award completions for certificates and degrees for your program in your program review. And as you're looking at all of this information, you should be looking at it from an equity lens also. Um, who's getting these degrees and awards? Who's doing well in my programs? Um, who's succeeding? Who's staying? Um, are, you know, what's the persistence uh, for the most important courses in our, in our program? And when we think about these things, we want to look at um, bring all that data and all that analysis and incorporate it into your program review narrative. You should be writing a really good narrative who, and speak to each one of these things. So when you're looking at your award completions, um, who's getting those awards? Is there a certain population who uh, achieves that award more than others? or a certain population that doesn't finish the program. And you wanna ask those questions, why? Why are these particular populations uh, not staying in the program? If you're looking at retention, why are they not being successful in the program? Um, and it's one thing to speak to it, but you really need to you know, have a really good conversation and think about what can we do to improve uh, our DEI population in completing awards, completing our programs, being successful, 
and staying persisting from semester to semester in important courses in our programs in order so that they can complete the program. And you also want to look at what is uh, what is the impact on these groups? Um, are, where are we losing them at or where are they not being successful at? Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit in a little bit more. But as you're doing your program review and you're looking at all this analysis and you're writing your narrative um, and addressing each one of these things, and maybe you need to address certain populations specifically, um, and I'll talk about those populations in a minute. Um, you should be looking and writing program goals within your program review to help close those gaps. I'm going to just do a quick chat um, and see what's going on. So you have people are saying yes, that they do all these together. Um, they're doing their PLOs. They're also writing their program reviews. I know many of us wear many hats. So make sure that as you're writing your program review that you're really looking at each one of these areas um, and trying to really disaggregate that data because if you just look at a course success rate and maybe you know one of you take out your core courses for your program and you say well you know overall 70 percent of our students are succeeding in this course you can either say that's really great or 75%, but what about the other percentage? Why are they not succeeding? Why are they not finishing? Why are we losing those students? And let's look at not only who those students are, but what is happening that's causing them to uh, not be successful or not to stay in the program. <coughs> Excuse me. As we're looking at all of this information and all this data, as I said before, really look at it through an equity lens. Um, look at student characteristics. You also want to do some trends. Because our student populations, especially since COVID, has really maybe changed. Um, you know, at our college, and I'm sure at many of your college, we have students from all over California. We have international students. Um, we're a Latinx serving, a Hispanic serving college at my college. Um, but our student population tends to shift as our neighborhoods shift, um, as people move around, as more students move online. Um, so look at your student population and try to look at five-year trends. Do you see any trends? And then also you should be looking at, this is trends within your program, but also looking at enrollment, enrollment college-wide, and then enrollment in your program. And sometimes I'm just going to give you a real simple kind of comparison um, if you have, say, an automotive program, your enrollment makeup might be 90% male and 10% female. Um, it might be, you know, a certain ethnicity that enrolls in automotive programs more often than other groups. And so you want to look at why, um, why those, that po those specific populations are enrolling in that program and how can we encourage other populations to enroll in these courses or enroll in these programs. So we're gonna look at the enrollment makeup of your programs as well. And you know, the counter to that might be that if you look at a child development program, you might have mostly uh, women uh, as a population for that, or you might have a certain, you know, uh, ethnicity that enrolls in that program more than others. And so you wanna look at that as well. So look at it from an equity lens. Uh, look at the degrees and certificates uh, that your college overall is awarding and who's getting those. And then uh, you know, establish some benchmarks. Your college should have some benchmarks and then look at your own program and your own program review and see if your program is meeting those benchmarks um, or where you might be falling short, or even where you might be succeeding um, or exceeding um, the benchmarks. And so as you're writing your program review narrative, you want to be speaking to each one of these and looking at it from an equity lens, looking at student achievement, um, looking at student characteristics, you know, uh, do a really good five-year trend or rolling five-year trend or whatever your cycle is. If your cycle is a three-year trend, you could do that, whatever data is available to you. Looking at your enrollment, um, are most of your students moving online and who are those students that are online? Is there a certain subpopulation of students that are mostly online within your courses or who's coming to campus? 
Um, you also, you know, I don't have it on here, but you want to be looking at, um, as you're looking at course success and student learning, what might be some of the uh, struggles or hindrances to student learning? You know, is it housing insecurity, food insecurity, transportation? Um, are they working multiple jobs? Are they, you know, uh, homeless students? So there's lots of things to consider when you're looking at student success and program review. And you want to be looking, you want to do a really good granular dive into your course assessment data, your program data, your student achievement data, your student characteristic data. And I know all this seems kind of like, wow, this is overwhelming. And there's lots of things to talk about in a program review. And every one of these you should be looking at from equity lens. Um, but if you start a little at a time and say, okay, look at your general data overall, where do I see some, you know, really obvious equity gaps? And then you can start focusing on those. Pick one or two of those and start focusing on how can we uh, close those equity gaps? What can we do um, and what program goals and how can we address those ways to close those equity gaps within program review while we're writing our program review? Any questions? You want to put your questions in the chat? I'm open to any questions anytime you're ready to ask anything. I know I've you know, given you lots of information so far. Okay, then. All right. I also like to show this kind of diagram because, like I said, we often think, okay, I'm doing course assessment and my department chair is doing program review and somebody in administration is deciding what our strategic goals and plans are. And we have, excuse me, our ISLOs or our GEs outcomes, and we have a college mission statement. But really, if you look at it as a funnel, either it goes from the top and funnels down, which is, you know, you could look at it that way. But I try to think of it as let's go the other way. Let's go from the course outcomes and go up. They should be, it should be going both ways. They both should be driving each other. Include your course outcomes in your program review. Your program review should be addressing your strategic goals and plans, your ISLOs, your college mission. All of this interconnects um, and feed into each other up and back down again, both. Um, they, none of them stand alone, if you will. So if you see um, equity gaps or you see some gaps in skills or abilities, you really need to see what's the cause. And oftentimes, um, it may not be obvious, so why not ask your students? And this is why I say get your students involved in program review. You could do some graduation surveys. You could ask instructors just to survey their students in their classes. Um, you can put some great surveys, anonymous surveys in Canvas. Um, you might ask them about what's their overall experience in your program. What maybe were things that they struggled with? Uh, did they not, What you know, was the curriculum did it flow for them? Did we not offer the courses that they needed to complete the program? Did we not offer them in the modality they needed to complete the program? Um, you also might see, are there some gaps just in the evaluation process ourselves? Um, do we need to relook at how we assess course outcomes? It's possible that our assessments for course outcomes could be biased within themselves. And if that's the case, we need to think about Maybe our DEI, DEI populations on the assessment don't do well because of the assessment itself. And so we need to look at that also. And then we can talk about that in program review. Here's our assessment. Here's the students that did well on this assessment, on this particular course assessment. Here's the students that didn't. And talk about how you might rewrite that assessment or how you might redo that assessment. Um, is that the verbiage, the terminology that you're using, uh, the method, the way you're giving that assessment? Are you giving formative assessments and then a summative assessment at the end, or is it just one big one at the end? Um, so there's lots of things you should be looking at when you're looking at the evaluation process itself uh, for program learning outcomes and course outcomes. And you need to speak to those in program review. And you need to look at, in order to close those gaps, what can I do in program review to help close those gaps? What can we as a program do 
and what do we need to do it? Um, and I'm sure I have this on another slide, but I'm just gonna speak to it now. If you have uh, equity gaps or just gaps in general, and you need to address them and you see issues either in the evaluation process or in course sequencing or curriculum um, or modality, whatever it is, you can write a program goal that addresses that. And then once you write your program goal, you need to establish some action items in order to achieve that goal. You say, I have this program goal. My program goal is I want to close the equity gap uh, for Latinx students um, in, the, in this particular course or within our program. Okay, so what do I need to do that? Well, we see that uh, maybe a lot of our Latinx students uh, want to take this course online. We don't offer it enough online or we only offer it, you know, one time during the day if it's on campus. Maybe we can change that. Maybe we need to bring in some tutors uh, into a course. If our students aren't doing well, let's try to identify how can we support them can we support them by, you know, providing tutors, discipline specific tutors, if you will, not just, hey, go to the academic success center or your tutoring center and get some help, but discipline specific tutors. Uh, maybe they need writing assistance. Can we provide them with writing guides, either online writing guides, ebooks, actual books in the library they can check out to help them? Can we, you know, create a cohort um, between a course and a writing course to help support students? There are various ways that you can write program goals and incorporate uh, ways or methods to close gaps within your program review. Uh, one of the things that you know we saw on our campus is um, I, I, I teach history and that our students, some of our students had struggled with writing in history. And so we, we sat down as a program and we said, okay, our students aren't doing well in some of these courses that have extensive writing because they don't have the writing skills to be successful in the course. So what can we do? So what we did was we were able to meet with our tutoring center and ask them, could they please hire a tutor who had experience in writing for history? And then, so we were able to get them to hire a grad student. <clears throat> Excuse me, let's go drink water here. We were able to coordinate for them to hire a grad student as a part-time writing tutor, a grad student in history. Um, that tutor actually created some workshops that were specific to history and to writing in history. We also purchased some writer's guides, like 30 copies. We put them in the library so our students could check out their writing guides because they were like, you know, $30 if students had to purchase them directly. So we really sat down and we had conversations about um, also, can we assess student learning in other ways besides writing? Could we look at portfolios? Could we create some projects, which we did? Can we, you know, do you maybe do some video assessments or oral presentations to assess their learning? So we really had some really good conversations and we incorporated all that into our program review. And then we identified what did we need in order to make this goal happen, to close this equity gap, for students in our history courses. So it was really good conversations and, and really uh, intense conversations at some times, you know, because you get every, you know, different people's ideas of why those gaps exist and what can we do. But that was the one thing that we thought if we can help students with writing, then they can demonstrate their learning um, more accurately, which would then help them succeed in the program. And, and it's been quite uh, it's been quite successful. We've had really good participation from our students in attending the workshops, uh, specifically uh, designed for history and meeting with our history writing tutor. So I just kind of wanted to show you this because sometimes we talk about, who, you know, what equity gaps do we need to think about? Who are we talking about? It's really specific to your college. Um, who is the student population that you're serving? This is just, I, I took this from our college website. You know, um, this is not course specific or program specific, but it does give us a really good idea of what population should we be looking at? Who's enrolling in our courses? Um, and who are some of these folks? Do we have issues with persistence from term to term? And who might, where are those equity gaps at? And we look at equity gaps, we're not talking just about 
uh, ethnicity. Uh, we're looking at other things, LGBTQ. We're looking at foster youth. Uh, we're looking at dreamers, economically disadvantaged students, veteran students, DSPS students, students who might be housing insecure. So we're looking at all different populations when we're talking about equity gaps and closing equity gaps. Um, this is just, you know, a graph for our college about where our equity gaps exist in regards to uh, persistence or transfer. Um, if your students are taking your courses, if you have like an AA-T, a transfer degree, um, look at who's getting those AATs um, and what can we do to help close equity gaps for the students who aren't finishing and getting those degrees. You know, we're all moving towards, you know, new funding and, you know, the new funding source in, in California, at least, um, and trying to get students to complete their degrees and transfer. And then also look at what is the goal? What is your student's educational goal? Are we helping students achieve their ed educational goal? If they're here to get a certificate, are they getting the certificate of performance, a certificate of achievement? Do they want their AA? Um, are they in a career field, CTE field? Are we meeting them and helping them where they are? And so when you're looking at your equity gaps, try to you know, expand um, the populations that you're looking at. And it might be a good place to start is to go to your, if you have a, an equity uh, or a DEI lead person on your campus and ask them, where are our college equity gaps? And then take those and look at your program and do a deeper dive down into your program and look at the equity gaps within your program. So what's the goal of program review and outcomes assessment? It's really student success and student learning. That's really where it is. Everything we do for program review and course outcomes, program learning outcomes is really driven by the desire to improve student learning and student success. So what does assessment data do? It helps us identify those gaps in student achievement. Um, the goal obviously is to improve equity within the classroom. Um, it may be through professional development. It may be through providing resources uh, for students or even for your faculty. Um, oftentimes, you know, maybe our faculty just need support also. Maybe they need to aid in the classroom. Maybe they need some professional development about how to reach certain communities, um, student communities. Uh, we want to improve student success. We want to improve student retention. That's really the goal of program review and outcomes assessment. Um, and you may need to, in order to do these things, make some changes to your course curriculum. And oftentimes this is the piece that we kind of forget about. If we look at our courses and we start to see that students are generally successful in one course, but then the following course, maybe they're not, or the course after that, if it's a sequence of courses, maybe they're not, you know, progressing or continuing. So we have to go back and look at, are we introducing the skills that they need to be successful in the first course? Are we introducing them well in that first course? Are students learning them in that first course? Are we reinforcing them in the next course? Are we allowing students the opportunity to master those skills in, at some point? And so sometimes you have to look at your courses. Maybe our course sequence isn't, isn't good. Maybe we need to move some courses around. Maybe we need to you know, look at our, you know, our course objectives and say, Maybe we need to reintroduce a, a specific skill or introduce it entirely in order to help students be successful. And this can be really important in courses or programs where there's a skill building uh, in order to be successful, say, you know, in math, um, trigonometry, maybe I'm not a math person, so I apologize if there are math people here. In order to be successful in trigonometry, maybe you need to, you know, know some basic algebra or advanced algebra. Uh, but if a student takes that out of order, um, then maybe they might, may not have that skill set to be successful in that, you know, third course, if you will. And so we want to look at in program review, look at course curriculum and course sequencing. Um, we also need to look at our assignments and materials. Um, if you have instructors who give one assessment at the end of the course or a midterm and a final, and we're not doing formative assessments, or assignments that allow students to uh, have some repetition of a skill or build on something that the content that they're learning, 
So maybe sit down, especially if you see uh, maybe a, a trend with a certain student population or with a certain course, look at the assignments in that course. Um, are, you know, are students able to achieve on those assignments? Are they meaningful? Anytime you have an assignment in a course, it should be centered on a course outcome. You want to, you know, I always tell my instructors, put the course outcome that you're looking at right on the assignment and tell the students, this is what you should be learning by completing this assignment. Um, you also want to look at materials. Are the textbooks do the textbooks leave out certain populations in conversations? Um, are they representative of the populations that your college serves? Um, are they older? Maybe they don't meet, you know, current, uh, uh, you know, issues or concerns. Have they been updated? Uh, look at the materials that the course or the program is using and see if there's some uh, ways you can make improvements there. Um, and then also, obviously, the goal of program review and outcomes assessment is to close those equity gaps. If you do all of these things, you're going to see improved student learning. If you, you know, if you start just having conversations, um, and don't forget to always include students in those conversations. The students should be um, really involved in there. When you have conversations about course assessments, um, you should introduce those course outcomes to your students tell them how you're going to assess them. And then if they don't do well on an assessment, an exam or an assignment, then have a conversation with your students and ask them, what did you need? What would you need in order to be successful on that, on that assignment or on that exam? And then bring that information into those conversations about program review and include those. Okay, let's write a goal. Our students said in order to be successful on this, they need greater access to the lab. And to be able to get in the lab more often, or they need to have, you know, access to uh, certain supplies, or they need a tutor, or whatever it is, include that in your program review as well. So looking at those gaps, how do I fill them, identifying where those gaps are, and always looking through an equity lens. So after all of this, We've done all this great work throughout our whole cycle. This is not something that you're doing one semester. You're doing this continually. You're gonna start at the beginning of your cycle um, and you're gonna keep building from that. And like I said, sometimes you know it can be overwhelming, um, but if you just pick maybe one thing that you wanna work on and think about that, what can we do in one course or two courses that you know, they're really like hard, um, the courses that are the core of your program, let's look at those first and see what we can do. Let's take that information and incorporate it into our program review. Let's write some really good quality program goals in order to close some of those gaps if we need to. Let's write some really good resource requests in order to help support and complete those program goals. So how can assessment findings help you with your program review? How can it help you establish and inform program needs? First of all, you can use that data to ask for new positions. If your students aren't doing well because you know, your courses are overflowing with students, you got 45, 50 students, and you just can't meet the needs of those students, you can use this data and say, we haven't had new instructors, we haven't had new faculty for whatever, five years. Our course, our program is growing. We want to sustain our program. But in order to do that and really support students, here's our data. We need more faculty. So you can use that data to ask for new positions. You can use that data to ask for equipment or resources. Um, if you need new lab equipment, maybe you only have five X, Y, Z, whatever it is, and students can't use it because there's not enough of them, and that's hindering their success in that course, or it's hindering their ability to go through a sequence of courses, or complete a program, get that degree or award, you can ask for those things in your program review. And you'll have the data and the information to support it. Oftentimes we say, okay, we need, uh, you know, I need new lab equipment for this course. Um, but we don't address why. Why do we need it? And how is that going to help our college? How is that going to uh, meet our students where they are? How is it gonna help us achieve our program mission? How is it gonna help us achieve our college mission? So we can use this data to justify the things that we need. 
We could also use the data for support services. In the example I gave you, uh, we took our data and we said, here's our data. Here's our retention data, our success data. Um, here's our enrollment data. Here's everything about our history courses. And we went to our administration and we went to our, you know, our academic success center, our tutoring center, and we said, here's what we need. How can you help us? And we started collaborating. And no, it didn't happen right away. It took a couple of semesters, but we kept going back and we kept writing in our program review. And here we are. We have a really good, successful tutoring program, which is discipline specific for us. It's only one tutor, but he's there a couple of days a week. Our students can go in there. He offers workshops on other days. He does it on Zoom. He meets with them in person. Uh, we were able to buy these writing guides and put them in the library. Um, so we were able to, by using that data and showing it to our administration to get that support in place. Um, you could also, you know, if, you're, if your students are saying, we don't have internet, what can we do? Uh, many of us face this during COVID. What can we do to support our students? Or if they can't get on campus for transportation purposes, you know, people always say, well, they could just take the bus. They don't have a car. Well, it takes money to take the bus. <laughs> and then bus schedules don't always run when classes start. And so we have to look at all these things. We can also use that data to ask for professional development for ourselves, for our faculty. If it's been some time um, since maybe your faculty has had some uh, instruction or professional development on how to reach different populations, um, there are some really good professional development programs out there uh, that are specific to certain groups of populations that maybe would be participating in your program. Maybe you want to ask for funds or even bring in a speaker onto your campus, um, and you would have this data then to bring forward and show that to um, your administration. You might also see if you see, you know, and, and oftentimes we don't wanna talk about, well, what if one instructor's class isn't doing well? One instructor's course isn't doing well. You know, have that conversation with that instructor. It shouldn't be punitive. You're gonna have that conversation. What do you need in order to make your students successful? What do you need in order to help your students learn? And they're, you know, they're the first line of defense, if you will, and they're going to be really honest with you and tell you what they need. Maybe they need some professional development training on whatever technology, maybe whatever it is you ask them and, you know, don't approach it from a, a punitive perspective, but how can I help you help your students? Because it's all about student learning. Um, you can also, as I said before, use this information, this data to help make changes to your program. We talked about curriculum. You might want to do that. Um, you can use the data also to inform or eliminate a program. And nobody wants to eliminate a program. I understand that. But sometimes programs, uh, they need to change. They need to evolve. If, say, you have you know, a, a computer program and it's teaching old technology and students aren't enrolling in it, then let's look at that course and say, what can we do either to get rid of that course or that program? Can we, how can we make it more viable? Let's go through the program viability process. Let's look at it and see what can we do. And then maybe you wanna create a partnership, create an action plan, a partnership. The example I gave you was we met with our student services, we met with our library, and we, we created a partnership with them. And we said, what can we do to help each other? Um, you can also use this information to write grant proposals. You know, right now there's lots of money or some money, I guess, writing grant proposals for OER materials. If students can be successful because they don't have to buy books, you know, maybe they're not, uh, they can't afford the books. And so um, they kind of try to go through the course without actually reading the materials. If we can write a, a grant and get some OER materials or get some books um, during COVID, uh, we were able to write a grant proposal and we were able to purchase uh, two different uh, classes worth of readers for our students. So we can say, okay, it's a cost-free course. You can go to the library and check out the reader. Um, there's enough in here for the sections that we teach each semester. We want to use this particular book, uh, but it's not an OER material. So you can use all the data, all the information that you receive from course assessment, PLO assessment, 
write that into your program review. And then you can also use that to uh, support all the other things that I've just mentioned here. Um, use it. I mean, you're going to have it. Just keep collecting it. All right. So I'm going to use the last 10 minutes, five or 10 minutes to see if you have any questions for me. Um, I'm constantly doing training for our faculty. Um, and I'm constantly learning myself as well. What can I do to support our faculty? Any questions? Feel free to add them in the chat or raise your hand. I can't see everyone at one time. So if you want to just speak, uh, that's okay too. Any questions? How many of you, uh, you can just put in the chat if you think that uh, some of this information you're already doing. So can you please show the map with the college mission at the top? Absolutely. Let me go back to that slide. Whoops. Hold on a second. No, I think I closed my uh, thing here. Hold on a second. Sorry. Let me go back to sharing my screen. I might be able to do it if I can open up, <laughs> if I can open up my uh, presentation again. For some reason, it closed up. All right, let me go back here. I apologize. Share my screen. Here we go. So let me go to this one. This is the one you're speaking of. Can you see my screen now? Should be able to see it. Perfect. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, you know, and the reason why I like to use this diagram is because it really shows it's this funnel process. And, and we oftentimes, you know, think of it as well, it's just from a top down, but it should go the other way as well. It should go from course outcomes. All of these interconnect. Um, and so you can take your course outcomes, your course outcome assessment, filtered into program review. How does all that, you know, write in program review, how, what do I need to meet the strategic goals and plans to address our SLOs to, uh, you know, meet the college mission? Any other questions? Anything I can do to help you along your way? I will uh, show you. Uh, if you need to contact me, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to address your questions. Um, this is pretty much my full-time job here um, at Miramar. Well, thank you for your kind comments. If you want, you know, to sit down, uh, we actually developed a program review and outcomes assessment handbook that ties these together for our faculty. Um, and we've done some really great training to try to address this for our faculty. And I think it was something that was missing was being able to connect these two and looking at both of them together and also including looking at it through an equity lens. Thank you. If there's no more questions, if there is, I'll hang around for a few more minutes. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll be happy to address your questions. I appreciate you uh, joining me today.